The reaction mechanism is the sequence of steps that shows how reactants change into products. When we have a chemical reaction represented by this equation here, there's lots of information in this equation. We know the reactants, A and B. We know the products, C and D. We also know their stoichiometry as represented by these lowercase letters that represents coefficients. And if we can calculate the energies of the reactants and the energies of the products, we can also calculate the delta H of the overall reaction. But despite knowing all this information from the chemical equation, we don't know much about how it happens and what's actually going on inside this black box as reactants are being converted into products. Kinetics, on the other hand, informs us about reaction rate, how fast this reaction occurs, and we can use that then to determine what the rate law is, which has information about the reaction order. We can also know something about the transition state, at least the activation energy to reach that transition state. So what kinetics actually does is provide clues about what's going on in the black box. And for reaction mechanism, you can break that into a sequence of steps where each of the steps is called an elementary reaction. And these reactions represent a single molecular event. So unlike this overall chemical reactions, which can have many steps, an elementary reaction truly represents represents a single step. One important thing to keep in mind is that as scientists, we cannot prove a reaction mechanism. However, we can disprove bad mechanisms if the data doesn't fit. And if the data does fit, the best we can say is that the mechanism is supported by the experimental data. We return to this reaction that we've discussed in previous videos where nitrogen dioxide reacts with carbon monoxide to give nitric oxide and carbon dioxide. And based on experimental data, the rate law was determined to be second order in nitrogen dioxide. And what that meant then was that the simple hypothesis of a reaction mechanism where it's a single step and NO2 and carbon monoxide directly collide to give the products has to be incorrect. Because if this was just a single step reaction, then the rate law would reflect this collision, which would be one molecule of NO2 colliding with one molecule of carbon monoxide. The fact that the rate has no dependence on carbon monoxide concentration means that this simple hypothesis is incorrect. Here's another hypothesis of what might be going on in this reaction. So the overall reaction is found again at the top. And now in this proposal of a reaction mechanism, there's two steps. In the first step, two molecules of NO2 collide together to form one of the products, NO, and a new molecule, nitric radical NO3. This nitrate radical in the second step reacts with carbon monoxide to give back one of the reactant molecules NO2, but generates the second product CO2. In this mechanistic proposal, nitric radical is called an intermediate. An intermediate is neither reactant nor product. The intermediate is generated in the first step and then consumed in the second step. And because it's formed and consumed, it cancels out overall and doesn't appear in the overall chemical equation. One important rule about reaction mechanisms is that they must sum to the overall chemical reaction. So these two elementary steps, when you sum them, should give you a chemical reaction that's just 
the same as the overall. So down here, what I've done is I've just summed everything on the left side, which represents reactants, and I summed everything on the right side, which represents products. And from here, we can simplify the sum by seeing what appears on both sides. So nitric radical appears both on the left and right, so it can be canceled out. And NO2, which appears on the right, also appears on the left, so we can cancel out one molecule of NO2. And what that leaves us with is NO2 plus CO to give NO plus CO2, which is the same as the overall reaction. So an alternative to show that these elementary steps sum to the overall reaction is you can just cancel out the species that appear on both sides. So here, the intermediate NO3 is appearing on the right and again on the left, so we can cancel those out. NO2, again, appears on the right and in the left, and we can cancel out one of those. And what that leaves us is one molecule of NO2 and one CO on the left side. And on the right side for products, one molecule of NO and one molecule of CO2. In this two-step mechanism, the rate of each of these steps can be quite different. In this case, the rate of the first step is actually much slower than the rate of the second step. So to signify that, I have a turtle for the first step, meaning it's very slow, and for the second step, a nice sports car. So you can think about this overall reaction as a relay race where the turtle runs the first leg and the sports car runs the second leg. And if you want to think about the race time and where most of that time is spent, then it would be the time for this first leg, which is the first reaction. Because the sports car is so fast that its time in the second leg is negligible or insignificant relative to the time of the turtle in the first leg. And so what we call this is that the first step is the rate determining step, meaning that the rate of the overall reaction is being determined by this slow step and that roughly they're going to be equal. Here, I'll show you how to write a rate law for an elementary reaction. One thing to be mindful about elementary reactions is that they are written as they happen. This is not true for a chemical reaction because there can be many steps from reactants to products. But an elementary reaction, by definition, has to represent a single molecular event. And so here are three examples. And in this first one here, in one step, A converts to D. So the rate law for this step is rate is equal to rate constant times the concentration of A to the first power. And we know that this is first order with respect to A because that is how it's written. 1A goes to 1D. This is an example of a unimolecular reaction because there's only one concentration term in the rate law. In the second example, we have two molecules of A that react in this elementary reaction. And this would be a bimolecular reaction. And the rate law then would show two concentration terms here, A squared. In this third reaction, this would be a ter-molecular example where 1A and 2B molecules react to form products. And the rate law then would have three concentration terms, um, concentration of A times the concentration of B squared. Here's a specific example of an elementary reaction that we just saw in the proposed mechanism. 
So this was the first step where two molecules of NO2 react to give NO and the intermediate nitrate radical. We can also write a rate law for this reaction. It is bimolecular, and the rate would have the concentration of NO2 squared. The subscript 1 is in reference to the fact that this is the rate for the first step, and therefore K also has a subscript 1 because it's also referring to the rate constant of this first step. This next example is a little bit trickier. We have NO plus O2 reacting to form NO3. What's interesting now is that there's this double arrow, meaning that the reaction in the forward direction happens as the reaction in the reverse direction is happening. This is an example of a fast equilibrium where the chemical reaction is reversible. And we can also write the rate for the forward and the back direction. In a fast equilibrium, these rates would be equal. So rate 1 refers to this first step in the forward direction, and rate minus 1 refers to the backward reaction starting with NO3 in the reverse direction. We can use the rate law to replace these rate terms. In the forward direction, the reactants are NO and O2, so that becomes K1 times a concentration of NO times a concentration of O2. In the reverse direction, the only reactant is the nitrate radical. We can replace it with a rate constant, K minus 1, for the reverse direction times the concentration of nitrate. Coming back to this reaction mechanism, we can write the individual rate laws for each of these elementary steps. Um, so we just did the first one, and now we can write it for the second one, and we see that NO3 and carbon monoxide are present. Now, because the first step is so slow, that means the rate constant for K1 must be much smaller in value than the rate constant for the second elementary step. And we talked about this first step being the rate determining step. And this is an example of a mechanism where the first step is the slow one, or slow initial step. And one nice thing about this situation is that you can basically ignore every step after the slow initial step because they will not affect the overall rate. And so the overall rate then is identical to the rate of this first slow step. So this reaction mechanism proposal, where this is a slow initial step, would give the correct prediction of the reaction rate being dependent on the NO2 concentration squared. And so we can say that this mechanism is consistent with the data. In this reaction, two molecules of nitric oxide react with dioxygen to give two molecules of nitrogen dioxide. We can write the general rate law as rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of the reactants raised to some unknown reaction order. So we like to find what K and N M are based on the proposed mechanism. This proposed mechanism consists of two steps. And unlike the last case, the first step is actually a fast initial equilibrium. And the second step is the slow one. And so the second step would be the rate determining step. You can apply the rate law for each of these elementary steps. So we went over this example where we could write the rate law in the forward direction and the rate law in the reverse direction. And because this is a fast equilibrium where those two rates are equal, we can set these two equalities equal. For the second reaction, we can also write a rate law where the rate constant K is being multiplied by 
the concentration of NO3 and the concentration of NO. Because the second step is the slow step in this overall mechanism, it would be fair to say that the rate of the overall reaction should be almost equal to just the rate of the second step. So you might think then that I could take this rate law and simply use it for the rate law of the overall reaction. But here we run into a problem. You'll see that the rate law has to only be in terms of reactants. And so the problem with doing so then is that NO3 appears, which is an intermediate in this reaction. And that would not be legitimate for a rate law because it's not an actual reactant. So where do we go from here? Well, we can replace NO3 by using this first step, the fast equilibrium, to come up with an equality for NO3 that's only in terms of reactants. And then once we have what the concentration of NO3 is in terms of the reactants, we can plug it into this rate law and basically replace NO3 with just reactant terms. So if we solve for NO3 using this fast equilibrium step, we'll get that NO3 is equal to K1 over K minus 1 times NO times O2. And then if we plug in this whole equality into this term down here, we would get that the rate of the second step could be rewritten as K2 times K1 over K minus 1 times NO2 squared times O2. Now this is a valid rate law because only reactants appear. And so we can say that N is 2 and M is 1. This rate law has three concentration terms, which is interesting because the slow step is just a bimolecular reaction. But because it involves the intermediate, which is itself formed in a bimolecular reaction, then the overall rate law is much more complex. And now I would like to show you how reaction energy diagrams for a chemical reaction can also give you a lot of information about the mechanism or how the reaction occurs. So this is an example from the prior slide. And remember, this was a two-step reaction where the first step is a fast equilibrium to generate an intermediate nitrate radical. And the second step is a slow rate determined step where the intermediate reacts with another reactant molecule to generate the products. Here is the reaction energy diagram for this reaction. And it looks a bit complicated, but I'll walk you through the different parts. So as before, a reaction energy diagram has an energy axis going up along the Y and the reaction progress along the X as reactants turn into products. So we have reactants at the beginning at this energy level, and we have products at the end at this energy level. And their difference then would be the delta H of the reaction. But the path from reactants to products is the rest of this plot. And what's interesting is that there is another point, a saddle point, where an intermediate appears. In addition to the appearance of an intermediate species, you can also know that this is a two-step reaction because there's two transition states here and here. So in step one, where we generate the intermediate, we go through one transition state. And in step two, we go through another transition state to give products. And so this dotted line basically separates the first step from the second step. In this reaction, there are two transition states, one for each step. And there's also correspondingly 
two energy activation barriers represented by the blue and red arrow here, or EA1 and EA2. Now the breaks in this energy diagram are to imply that this is not drawn to scale and that this maximum is actually much higher. So what that means is the red arrow is much larger than the blue arrow, or that EA2 is much greater than EA1. This energy difference is captured in this reaction energy diagram because the second hump is much larger than the first hump. And that's consistent with a mechanism where the second step is the slow step and it is the rate determining step because th this barrier is so much larger than the barrier for the first step. A catalyst is a substance that when added to a reaction speeds up the reaction without being consumed. So how does a catalyst work exactly to speed up reactions? By adding a catalyst, you ultimately change the mechanism of the reaction. And typically, a good catalyst would lower the activation energy so that the catalyzed reaction would go much faster than the reaction without the catalyst. This energy diagram illustrates some of the key differences between the uncatalyzed reaction mechanism and the catalyzed mechanism. We will focus first on the uncatalyzed mechanism shown in red. So A and B are our reactants, and they react to form products through the single transition state located at very high energies. So this type of reaction energy profile is consistent with one step because there's only one transition state. And because we have two reactants that must react and it's only one step, then it must be bimolecular. And both the concentration of A and B would appear in the rate law. Catalyzed mechanism in green is completely different. Here you can see that there's a new intermediate C that's formed in the first step and then reacts with B to form products in the second step. So the catalyzed mechanism has two steps as also indicated by the presence of these two transition steps. In the first step, a reacts with the catalyst to form this intermediate C, and the activation energy barrier for this first step is represented by this blue arrow. In the second step, at this starting point, C then reacts with a reactant B to give product. And you can see that the second step has a much smaller activation energy relative to the first. And so this is an example of a mechanism where the first step is the rate determining step. If we were to write a rate law for this first step, we would write that it's a bimolecular reaction between A and the catalyst. So it might look something like this, where the rate constant is multiplied by both A and catalyst. Catalysts are not consumed during a reaction. So if we start with initial concentration of catalysts, that concentration is actually maintained throughout the reaction and at the end. So even though the concentration of A will vary, the concentration of the catalyst does not. And so we can replace this with something more specific such as the initial concentration of the catalyst. And because this is constant, we can collect the constant terms together, including the rate constant and the catalyst initial concentration to use a new rate constant referred to as K-cat. Therefore, this reaction should only be first order with respect to reactant A. We can compare the activation energy barrier 
of the catalyze mechanism in the rate determining step versus that in the reaction without a catalyst shown in red. And you can see that the blue arrow is much smaller than this red arrow. And so the activation energy of the catalyzed mechanism is much smaller than the activation energy of the uncatalyzed mechanism. Moreover, that also means that the rate constant for the catalyzed mechanism is also much greater than the rate constant for the reaction without the catalyst. Catalysts can be divided into three categories, homogeneous, heterogeneous, and biological. Biological would include enzymes. The remaining categories are abiological catalysts. Homogeneous describes catalysts that are in the same phase as the reactants and products. Heterogeneous, the catalyst, has a different phase from the reactants and products. There's a wide diversity of catalysts, and these pictures only show you three examples. First is a platinum metal surface, where each of these gray spheres represents a platinum atom. And the second example is a catalyst that's a molecule which contains a transition metal called rhodium at its very center. And this last example is an enzyme called diiron hydrogenase, where embedded in the protein are multiple clusters of iron and sulfur. Iron here in magenta, sulfur in orange. And this is a zoom of one of these clusters showing this intricate architecture in the active site of this enzyme. Hydrogen is an important molecule that appears in many examples of industrial and biological catalysis. If we were to break hydrogen gas by splitting it into two hydrogen atoms, in the absence of a catalyst, this would be a huge energy cost because the hydrogen bond enthalpy is 432 kilojoules per mole. In biocatalysis, the enzyme diiron hydrogenase consumes hydrogen to generate protons and electrons. And it does this very quickly. In fact, 10,000 hydrogen molecules are consumed every second. In industrial catalysis, an important reaction is shown here, where hydrogen gas is reacted with this molecule called ethene that has this carbon-carbon double bond. And in the product, the hydrogen-hydrogen bond is broken, and instead, new carbon-hydrogen bonds are formed. And this is often catalyzed by platinum metal. So because the reactants are in the gas phase and platinum metal is a solid, this would be an example of a heterogeneous catalysis. So here's the overall catalyzed hydrogenation of ethane to give ethane. The mechanism as catalyzed by a platinum metal surface is shown by these four pictures, which represents individual steps of the catalyzed mechanism. So this mechanism has these steps. In the first step, hydrogen, shown in cyan, comes in from the gas phase and binds to the metal surface represented by these neatly packed blue spheres. In the second step, one of the hydrogen molecules splits into two hydrogen atoms on the metal surface. And then the other reactant, ethane, can come in from the gas phase and also bind to the metal. And if it binds one of these separated H atoms on the surface, then a CH bond can form. In the next step, the second CH bond forms and then the product ethane is released from the surface. 
It is known that HH bond cleavage is the slow step, the rate determining step in this catalyzed mechanism. So how does the platinum catalyst work to lower the activation energy barrier for breaking this HH bond? If you look at the second image here, when you break the HH bond, you also form two platinum hydrogen bonds. And because you form these two bonds, that helps compensate for the energy cost of breaking the HH bond. And that's why when the platinum is present, the energy barrier to break dihydrogen is actually much lower than without the catalyst. This is an example of a homogeneous hydrogenation where you have this complex molecule, but you might recognize that it also has this carbon-carbon double bond like in ethane. So hydrogen can add to this double bond to form this ethane type product. And this is catalyzed by a rhodium molecule. After this catalyzed step, you can do a few more reactions to clean up this molecule, take away these peripheral groups, and what you have left is a new molecule called L-DOPA, which is actually a drug taken for treating Parkinson's disease. L-DOPA is shown here, and what's interesting about this reaction is that the reactant is originally flat. It was only two-dimensional. But after the hydrogenation reaction, where you've added hydrogen across the CC double bond, you generate a molecule that's no longer flat, but three-dimensional. And this is really important to how this drug works inside the human body. So the catalyst is this rhodium molecule here, and this is the, the catalyst is this rhodium molecule here, and this is an example of a homogeneous hydrogenation because this all takes place inside solution. So the catalyst is dissolved in solvent, and so is hydrogen and this starting organic molecule.